Well, good evening and a very warm welcome to you to our service um, tonight in Dingwall Free Church. It's a great pleasure to be with you here in Dingwall today, and we pray that God will bless um, our time together. Our call to worship this evening is from 1 Peter chapter 2. Here, Peter reminds us of our identity as the people of God, our identity as Christians. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. A wonderful reminder to us that we are here, we have been saved in order to declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. Our first song this evening is the hymn, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O my soul, praise him, for he is thy health and salvation. Let's listen to these words now. Let's unite our hearts in prayer. Let's pray together. Father, truly we adore you and we praise you and we worship you and we talk to ourselves in the words of the psalm that bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Be stirred up to magnify and bless his holy name. We know that, Lord, that reality that sometimes we have to stir ourselves up that doesn't always come naturally. But you are a God who is worthy to be praised. You are a God who is worthy of all our praise. And we pray that you would restore in us, your people, the joy of the Lord that is our strength. So often, Lord, there's a caricature of Christianity that is dull and joyless, and yet we see in the words of Jesus that he prayed in John 17 that his joy would be in us and that our joy would be complete. We see in these words that you are a God who is for our joy, who has purchased joy for us, a joy that this world cannot take away. And so, Lord, we pray that you would restore us and renew us in that very joy that we might be strengthened by it. We do pray, Lord, for our community and for our nation again, as we prayed this morning. Uh, today has been set aside as a day of prayer by the Free Church, and so we do pray that you would help this 
current pandemic to pass. We pray for all who've been affected by it, those who've been bereaved, those who have long-term effects from the virus, those who've been impacted economically or are worried about jobs and businesses, and there are so many, Lord, in that situation. We remember all those who, who are in difficult situations because of that. But we pray that you would renew us through this, Lord. You are shaking us. You are speaking to us. You are calling us to repentance. Judgment begins at the house of God. And we believe revival begins there too, Lord. And so we pray for you to come. We think of that great passage in Ezekiel where you showed Ezekiel the valley of the dry bones and you asked him, son of man, can these bones live? And you tell him to do two things, to proclaim your word to the bones, which just seems crazy. He is to preach to the dead. He is to preach to, to the dry bones, the long spiritually dead. But he is also to prophesy to the Spirit to come and to bring life to the bones. And we see that is what happens. As he speaks to your spirit and as he speaks to the bones, the bones come to life. And your breath renews them and brings life where there was only death. May that be a spiritual reality for us, Lord, in all our churches across the Highlands, across Scotland, across the UK, across Western Europe in particular, that you would bring life to the bones. And as your word is proclaimed, we also come and ask you, Holy Spirit, to do a work, a work that would resound to the glory of your name, a work that we cannot do. We thank you that we were the spiritually dead, but you brought us to life. You gave us the gift of new birth. And we pray that you would come and renew us. We need you, Spirit. As Jesus said to his disciples, they were to wait in Jerusalem until they were clothed with power from on high. And their need is our need. For the work of the kingdom is a work that cannot be done in our own strength, but can only be done through the work and the ministry of your Spirit. And so come and do a work. Bless uh, this congregation, Dingwall and Strathpeffer. We pray for these communities in particular, that you would minister and bless and that you would help this congregation to truly be a light in the darkness, to truly declare the praises of him who called them out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Bless this community, bless this congregation, and bless our nation. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Bible reading this evening is from Matthew chapter 14. We're in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 14, reading from verse 13 to 36. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed those who were ill. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We've, we have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said. And he told the people to sit down on the grass and taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. And he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. 
Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked in the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all who were ill to him and begged him to let those who were ill just touch the edge of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. Amen. And may God bless that reading of his own holy and inspired word. Well, this morning we were looking at walking through the dark valleys uh, through Psalm 23. This evening we're looking at being in a storm. Storms, just like the dark valleys we looked at this morning, can symbolize the difficult experiences that come our way in life. And here in this passage, we read of something absolutely astonishing. Peter walking on water. It's incredible, isn't it? Peter walked on water. So we're going to look at that incident together. Just to set the background, we have uh, Jesus feeding the 5,000. We read that together. Five loaves and two fish. He miraculously feeds 5,000 men. He then dismisses the crowd And at the same time, he puts the disciples into this boat and tells them to sail across the Sea of Galilee. Jesus goes to be with his father to pray. There's a big temptation upon Jesus at this point. I think it's John's gospel that gives us the detail. The people wanted to make Jesus king by force. And Jesus dismisses the crowd and he takes time to go and to pray. Then we're told that close to dawn the following morning, he sees the wee boat with the disciples out in the middle of the lake and they're being buffeted by a storm. They're being tossed by the waves. They're rowing with all their might and they're just not making any headway. They're struggling in the middle of this storm. And then Jesus does something amazing. He walks out to them on the water. That would be amazing if the sea was like a mill pond, wouldn't it? You know when you see the flat cam seas and it's just like glass, it's beautiful. It would be impressive to see Jesus walking on the water like that. But remember, this is in the middle of a storm. There's huge waves rolling in. There's huge swells running here. The disciples who had experienced sailors, they're struggling. They're stuck. And I'm sure they're they're scared. At At the very least, they're anxious and tired and exhausted. And through the storm, across these huge waves, comes Jesus walking on the water. And there's almost a comic reaction in that the disciples' first reaction is, it's a ghost. And Jesus says, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And actually what Jesus does there, he uses God's personal name. He literally says, take courage, I am, don't be afraid. Then we come to the moment that we're going to focus on this evening. Peter calls out to Jesus and Jesus says to him to come. And Peter climbs out of the boat, walks on the water, incredible, but He wavers, he wobbles, and he begins to sink, and he cries out to Jesus, and Jesus pulls him back out of the water. So three headings for us this evening. We're going to look at the courage of faith, the wobble of faith, and the object of faith. The courage of faith, the wobble of faith, and the object of faith. The courage of faith, first of all. There's a big question I want to tackle early on here. Was Peter right to ask what he asked? You know, Peter has a reputation, doesn't he, of being really impetuous. He's one of these guys that we can all relate to, I think. He just opens his mouth and says what everybody's thinking, 
And guaranteed, if any of the disciples are going to put their foot in it, it's going to be Peter. You read through the Gospels, he'll blurt something out, and most of the time, he's, he's off the mark. Was this Peter just being Peter? Was this Peter just speak first, think later? Should he have just been like the other 11 and stayed quiet and stayed in the boat? And I'll be honest and I'll tell you that commentators differ on this. So it's with a degree of fear and trepidation that I would say to you that John Calvin and Matthew Henry say that Peter was wrong to ask this. But dare I say, I think they're wrong. Please don't have any bonfires going to throw me on outside after the service for heresy. Calvin and Matthew Henry, for example, say that Peter shouldn't have said to the Lord, let me come to you on the water. And I'm going to suggest that there was nothing wrong with Peter asking what he asked. And here's my defense. The text itself does not criticize Peter for asking the question. There is no rebuke for Peter for walking on the water, for getting out of the boat, for asking the question. Jesus' rebuke to him is for his little faith and wobbling and beginning to sink. Why did you doubt? There is no rebuke for asking the question. Listen to what it says. Lord, Peter said, if it is you, and really that means since it's you, Lord, since it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So there's nothing to say that Peter's question was wrong. And in fact, when you look at what the text says, Peter's not being impetuous. Did you see the, the, the order there? He stayed in the boat until Jesus told him to come. He said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. Then Jesus said, come and then Peter got out of the boat. So it's not like he leaps out of the boat without thinking. He only comes when Jesus says, come. And notice as well that he's not simply asking to walk on the water like he's some kind of thrill seeker, just thinking that'd be a cool experience. He's wanting Jesus. Lord, let me come to you on the water. He wants to run out to see Jesus. It's Peter's heart for Jesus that is overflowing here. The heart of his request is to be near to Jesus. Lord, the reverence in that very word. Lord, if it's you, since it's you, let me come to you. And Jesus says, come. So Peter gets out of the boat at the specific request of Jesus, and Jesus has commanded him to come. That's why I would argue that Peter's desire was right, and there was nothing wrong in doing what he did. And in fact... Peter's wanting a good thing. And in fact, I would say Peter shows incredible courage. Remember what we said, this is not a mill pond. Confession time, I can't swim. So the thought of getting out of a boat in the middle of a lake is terrifying if it was a beautiful calm day. The thought of getting out of a boat in the middle of a storm as it's been tossed by the waves, the gales blowing. Would you get out of the boat? Would you be volunteering to climb over the side? Peter did. And I think Peter needs to be commended for his courage. He wants a good thing, and he shows incredible courage and incredible faith in Jesus to, to, to put himself over the side. Timber's creaking, the boat's rocking and rolling, and there's Peter jumping over the side to run to Jesus. I think it's a, an act of incredible courage. I'm sure he's relieved to see Jesus. He's delighted to see Jesus having been stuck in the storm, rowing all night. And he run, wants to come to Jesus. He shows incredible courage. And I think there's some comfort for us, something that can give us courage in our storms, is the fact that Jesus is in the storm with his disciples. What does Jesus do in the storm? He comes to his people. He sees them struggling, and he comes to them in the middle of the storm. Now, it's a fascinating thing that um, earlier in the Gospels, we read of Jesus calming a storm at a word. Remember that time Jesus was asleep in the boat and the disciples wake him up and they say, don't you care that we're, that we're drowning? And Jesus just gets up and he says to the storm, quiet, be still, and the storm goes away. Did you notice that what Jesus doesn't do here is as fascinating as what he does do? He looks out and he sees the boat struggling in the water. He could just go, quiet, be still, and the storm will go away, but he doesn't. He leaves the storm where it is. He leaves the wind blowing and the waves rolling and he walks to them in the middle of the storm and he comes to them in the storm rather than take the storm away. That's a fascinating detail. Sometimes Christ does that. 
He doesn't take the storm away necessarily immediately, but he does come to us in the storms. And the question that comes to mind, to mind would be, why would he do that? And I think the answer would be is that in this particular instance, they saw more of who Jesus was in the storm. Look what it says in verse 33. Those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. They got an experience and a revelation of Christ in the storm that strengthened their faith, that strengthened their knowledge of who Jesus was, who Jesus is, and their confidence and their courage in him. But what does Jesus do in the storm? He comes to his people. Even if he doesn't take the storm away, he meets us in the storm. William Cooper was an 18th century poet, a friend of John Newton, and it was a man who experienced depression, awful, terrible bouts of deep depression and bleak darkness. And he wrote a poem called Light Out of Darkness. And I'm sure these words are familiar to you. He says, God moves in a mysterious way, his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. He also speaks about those dark clouds over our head. The clouds we so much dread will burst with blessing upon our heads. So if you're in a storm tonight, you can take courage. Jesus sees you. He's aware of your struggles, just as he saw them in the boat, and he will come. Take courage in the storm, not because the storm isn't scary. The storm is scary. Not courage because we have got the strength to face it, because we don't. The disciples had rode all night and got nowhere. Their strength was spent. But courage because of verse 27. Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Take courage, Jesus is with him, with them and with you. And tonight, if you're listening to this, and life's hard for you, can I say that there's one thing we need more than anything else. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and as your Savior, it's great that you might be listening to this. But the one thing that you need is the thing we all need this. Not relationships, not new, uh, new job or more money or, or physical healing, whatever it might be. No, any of these things are unimportant. The one thing that we need more than anything is a relationship through faith with Jesus Christ. We need Jesus. We need Jesus because he's the only one who can bring us back to God. He's the only one who can deal with our sin issue. He's the only one who can, who can give us eternal life. And he's the only one who can give us real confidence in real situations in our real lives. You might wonder, you might ask the question, how would Jesus receive me? You'll get the same reception as Peter. Peter says, Lord, tell me to come to you. And Jesus says, come. And that's what Jesus says to the world. Come to me, all you who labor, who are weary and who are burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who are tired and broken, who are weak and who are weary, and I will give you rest. You will find rest for your souls. Jesus' command is come. Come to me and find life. Come to me and find peace. Come to me and find forgiveness. And come to me and find what it is you're looking for. Come to me, and he turns nobody away. And if we have our trust in Jesus, we can have this amazing confidence that we know that we are never alone, but he is with us always. We have a helper. We have a, sa a savior who is with us in the storms. Two last things before we move on to our second point. When we think of Peter's request, there's two more things that occur to me. The first is this. Don't be afraid to ask big things of Jesus. Don't be afraid to ask big things of Jesus. His ability to answer and his heart to give far exceed our asking. I'm sure you, you're aware of the story, and I'm probably going to butcher this story now, but I think it was Alexander the Great, who one of his generals came to him and asked him something that was considered outrageous. He wanted him to pay for the, I think it was the marriage of one of his daughters, and it was an astronomical amount he wanted. It was a huge, lavish affair, and he asked Alexander the Great to pay for it. And Alexander the Great's advisors were horrified at the, at the impertinence of this man. They, were, they actually asked that he should be thrown into the jail, all his ranks and titles removed because of the, the, sheer, the 
sheer brass neck he showed in asking this question. Alexander the Great says, no, no, he's actually done me a great favor because he believes me both wealthy enough to pay for his request and he believes me generous enough to be willing to do it. He's actually paid me a great compliment. Don't be afraid to ask big things of Jesus. Someone once said, if we offer God a thimble, he'll fill the thimble. If we offer him a bucket, he'll fill the bucket. If we offer him an ocean, he may be gracious enough and fill that too. Don't be afraid to ask big things of Jesus. Peter says, command me to come to you. And I wonder what the 11 disciples felt at that point. Did they start thinking things like, who does he think he is? How dare he ask that? That's an outrageous thing to ask. I wonder what the other 11 apostles thought about Peter's request. We're not told. So it's sheer conjecture, but it's interesting to think about, isn't it? Did they feel Peter had taken leave of his senses? And yet Peter's request is met by this. Yes, come, your request is granted. And in this situation, I think the other apostles could have learned from Peter. The second thing, the central, the central thing in our being a disciple, a follower of Jesus, is our relationship to Jesus. Behind this request of Peter is his relationship with Christ. He loves him. He desires him. He wants to be with him. So we need to guard that at all costs. Being a Christian is not about religious activity as such. It's not just about uh, religious performance or religious activity. It's centered on a person. It's centered on a Jesus Christ. And we need to guard that relationship. We need to guard our hearts and protect that and nurture that and feed that. So let's ask that question this evening. Where are our hearts at? So we strip away the outward appearance. What does our heart say about Jesus? Where do our hearts stand? And I wonder, I said two things, but I'm going to throw a third one in. I wonder if someone listening to this, is the Lord calling you to get out of the boat? Is the Lord calling you to get out of the boat, to take a step that is out of your comfort zone, to take a step that is that you're maybe scared about. He's calling you out of your comfort zone. He's calling you to something. Is the Lord calling you out of the boat tonight? As the book says, if you want to walk on the water, you've got to get out of the boat. But can I encourage you with this? If the Lord tells you to take that step, if the Lord is calling you to come out of the boat, if the Lord is calling you to himself to do whatever it might be, do it. You'll find that he'll provide everything that you need You might be sitting at home thinking, well, he's calling me to this, but I can't do that. Correct, you can't, but he can. Peter can't walk on water on his own, but Jesus can. If the Lord's calling you out of the boat, listen to his voice and come. And you will find he holds you, and you will find he equips you, and you will find he does more than you can ask or even imagine. The courage of faith. Secondly, the wobble of faith. We're told that Peter gets out of the boat, walks on the water, and comes to Jesus. Now, A lot of the commentaries and a lot of the sermons I hear in this, they focus on Peter's sinking. I want to focus for a second on the fact he walked on water. That is cool. That is an incredible experience. He walked on the water, but he wobbled, just like we do, don't we? Which of us can't relate to Peter here? We shouldn't get on our high horse and go, Peter, I can't believe you doubted the Lord. I can't believe you you let these things creep in because we do it all the time, don't we? It would have been so easy for the 11 disciples in the boat to go, ha, that didn't end so well for you, did it, Peter? But Peter had an experience that they didn't have, didn't he? He experienced walking on the water. He experienced the Lord's grace in Jesus rescuing him, pulling him back out of the water. He experienced, even in his wobble, he had an experience of the Lord that the others didn't get. But what went wrong for Peter? Why did he begin to sink? Well, verse 30 says, When he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Matthew tells us the problem. It says, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. He became afraid. That fear caused the wobble. And when you look at it rationally, it doesn't make sense. Was the wind a new thing? No, the wind was there when he got out of the boat. The storm hadn't changed. The wind wasn't new. Jesus' command was still the same, wasn't it? What did Jesus say to him? 
come. Jesus' command hadn't changed. The storm hadn't changed. The circumstances hadn't changed. All of a sudden, Peter's attitude to them had changed, though he began to be afraid. He began to look more at the wind and its power than Jesus and his power. Hugh Martin, one of the great Scottish theologians of the past, said in his little book on Simon Peter, he says, Come to me. Until that word was recalled, it ought to have been more powerful to Peter than all tempests. It's a great wee quote. Jesus had said to him, come. But he looked at the wind, he saw the wind, and he began to be afraid. And you know, at its heart, our unbelief is irrational, isn't it? All sin is irrational at the end of the day, but it shows the humanity of Peter. He's a sinner just like we are. He's a real person just like we are. And he became afraid just like we do, and his fear caused him to begin to sink. Fear is a powerful, powerful emotion, and doesn't that lie behind so many of our other sins? But what does Peter do when he begins to sink? He cries out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. And what does Jesus do? He immediately, we're told, immediately reaches out his hand and immediately pulls Peter back up out of the water. Verse 31, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You know, I heard a really helpful analogy. And uh, the preacher was Matt Chandler, an American preacher in Texas, and he spoke about his, his daughter when she began to walk for the first time. And he says, she pulled herself up on the furniture as, you know, toddlers, as they become toddlers, they do begin to be able to stand, and then they take those first few steps. And he said, she, she took her first few steps and then fell over as babies will do. And he said, what was our response to that? Did we go, look at that idiot, she just fell over. He said, no, we were celebrating the steps that she took. We were rejoicing that she had taken her first steps. And you know, doesn't Satan want us to get us to focus on the fall? But sometimes I think as well that the Lord rejoices in the steps. He rejoices in the steps of faith we've taken, and maybe we have wobbled, and maybe we have fallen but we have taken steps that we've never maybe taken before. And there's something to be celebrated in that. We learn from the falls, we learn from the failures, we learn from the mistakes, but we can't forget as well the steps that have been taken too. Satan wants to focus us on the falls, but no child learns to walk without falling. And no disciple of Jesus grows in their faith without falling either. He cries out to Jesus when he does mess up, and immediately Jesus reaches out his hand and catches him. He doesn't stand with his arms folded and went, no, Peter, you got yourself into this, you can get yourself out. He doesn't stand there and go, Peter, I told you what to do, I can't believe that you've, you've started looking at the wind and becoming afraid. He doesn't do any of that. He immediately reacts to Peter's prayer and draws him up out of the water. Peter wobbled, but Jesus didn't. Peter's faith was weak, but the one his faith was in was strong. And that's the whole thing about faith. It's not, what our, it's not how strong our faith is. It's how strong the one our faith is in is. It's not faith itself that saves us. It's faith in Jesus that saves us. Jesus saves us through faith. And Jesus scolds Peter a bit here. And again, this is something that fascinates me, and it's maybe something to think about. We know what Jesus said but I wonder how he said it. You of little faith, why did you doubt? Did he say that angrily as a rebuke? You of why did you doubt? Or did he say it as I might sometimes say to my toddler, what are you doing? With a smile on my face, they do something silly and he falls over and go, well, that was silly. How did Jesus say those words? We don't know. We know what he said, but we don't know how he said it. But when Peter wobbled, Jesus was there. When Peter sank, Jesus was there. And maybe as we face our storms or as you face your storms this evening, maybe what we need to remember tonight is this. Maybe it's not about trying to be stronger. But maybe what we need in our storms is to be weaker and to rest in the arms of Jesus. That's the courage of faith, the wobble of faith, and lastly, the object of our faith. You see, if we focus this whole sermon on Peter, we've made the same mistake as Peter. 
Because who's the whole Bible all about? Jesus. And if we don't spend time thinking and looking at Jesus, we've made the exact same mistake as Peter's made. It's what we see about Jesus here that should help us in our fears, help us in our storms, help us in our wobbles. Jesus is the Lord of the storms. He comes walking in the, through the wind and the waves to his people. The disciples were in the boat in the first place because Jesus had put them there. Jesus put them in the boat. Jesus sent them out into the storm. Nothing happens apart from Jesus' sovereign will in our lives. And while the disciples battled the storm, what was Jesus doing? He was praying. The New Testament tells us that we have a great high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us. That as we go through our storms, Jesus is praying for us in the courts of heaven. That's an amazing thought. And in the storm, Jesus comes to his struggling disciples present with us in our troubles. It's Jesus' strength that keeps Peter above water. It's Jesus' strength that will keep us in the storms as well. But through the strength of Christ, Peter managed to do something amazing and he walked on the water. A miracle occurred. Through, a strength, through Christ's strength, Peter walked on the water. Through Christ's strength, Peter was rescued from the water. Through Christ's strength, Peter came through that storm. And through the strength of Christ, the storm went away. So when we go through our storms, keep your eyes on Jesus. As it says in verse 33, they, they worshipped him. Truly you are the Son of God. Let's do the same. Guard your hearts. Keep your focus on Jesus, your Savior, who loves you, who is with you in the storms, who is able to bring you through the storm and is even able to, to do amazing, miraculous things in the storms, even if the security of the boat is gone. And that's one thing coronavirus has done, hasn't it? It's taken away all our old securities, all the things we were so familiar with and felt safe in. They've been shaken and they've wobbled. And maybe you've been wobbled. But if you have Jesus as your Savior, you're as secure out of the boat as in it. You're safe in the arms of Jesus. Keep your eyes on him. Amen. May God bless his word to us this evening. We're going to conclude our service with the words of Psalm 107, verses 23 to 26, the Scottish Psalter version of the psalm. And in this psalm, we read about people who go to sea in ships, who experience great storms at sea, but the Lord bringing an end to these storms and taking them to the haven they so desire to see. So let's listen to the words of Psalm 107. Who go to sea in ships and in great waters conclude with uh, the words of the benediction, God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs>